welcome to Book Passage. As always, we thank you for supporting independent bookstores like this one. If you have a cell phone with you, if you can check it now, make sure it's on silent or turned off. Everyone around you will appreciate that. If you haven't had a chance to pick up a copy of Dennis's latest book, it's available at all the registers that you pass on your way in tonight. And in about an hour after some presentation and some Q&A, you'll have a chance to pick up a copy once you pay for it and bring it on back in here, and he'll be signing um, at the table next to me. We kind of thought there would be a few people here tonight uh, for this man, so welcome to our latest uh, episode with Dennis Lehane. And I'm going to leave the introduction of him to our own David Corbett, who luckily for us uh, stopped working as a private investigator for 15 years and became a writer. Um, and he's going to talk to you about our uh, summer uh, mystery conference, of which he is a part, mm -hmm. and also introduce Dennis Lehane. Please welcome David Corbett. Um, yeah, I am a co-chair of the Mystery Writers Conference uh, this year. Uh, we have a particularly nice group of folks coming this year. We've got Otto Penzler, probably one of the greatest publishers in crime fiction history. We've got Hallie Efron, as always. We've got Thomas Perry, who's wonderful. And um, so if you are a writer or know a writer who is interested in the crime field, is interested in putting their work in front of agents or learning a bit more craft, please, it happens in July. Registrations are here at the store or online. There's a uh, newsletter available if you'd like to check that out or you think there's someone in your life who would like that, please do so. It's a wonderful conference. I've done conferences all over the country and all over the world, and this is my favorite. <laughs> it's a great group of people. It's always very collegial, very friendly, always a great time for everyone. Um, okay, as mm -hmm. you probably know by now, I am not Dennis Lehane. And um, <laughs> I can talk about Dennis a lot. I could introduce him, but you probably know who he is already or else he wouldn't be here. Um, I'd rather, like, in a certain sense, just introduce this book. Um, I'm a little pacey at the moment because I was about 100 pages into the book yesterday, and I thought, okay, if I, I can read 100 tonight and then catch up tomorrow, and then I'll have it ready. You know, I'll finish it by the time I have to introduce it. It was 10 o'clock at night, and I went, oh, I have to get 100 pages. Well, maybe I'll just read half of that. It was 2.30 in the morning finally <laughs> when I stopped reading. I, and I'm not that way. I mean, when you're a writer, you don't get a whole lot of time to read for pleasure. And when you do, you're kind of checking out the plumbing anyway when you're reading. You're kind of, you know, okay, how's he doing this? How's he doing that? Um, I haven't had this much enjoyment out of a book in a very, very long while. And then, okay, like I said, I was up until 2.30 reading it. And then I was up until 6 o'clock thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know that because the sprinklers come on at 6 o'clock. <laughs> and I was still lying there looking at the ceiling thinking, whoa. It is just um, an amazing book. It's the third in the Joe Coffin series. And uh, I don't think, though, that you need to read others, other, others two to enjoy this book, though I heartily recommend you do so. And I think uh, we've got them on hand if you want to read either of those two books or any of Dennis's other books. But um, this is a gangster story. And gangster stories always appeal because they at least presume to tell us how things really work. Dennis has done an amazing amount of research with this book, and he's put he's just layered it in so effortlessly, you don't even know it's going by. It's paced brilliantly, it has characters you won't forget, and an ending that will haunt you long after the sprinklers start. <laughs> Seriously, all books this smart should be this fun. Um, and so why don't we hear from the man who wrote it, Dennis Lane. weird for me because uh, me and um, Harlan Coben came here at the beginning of our careers and we did a, we did a dual uh, tour together figuring it would it would it would spark a little interest and there were six people here <laughs> and, and Harlan and I sat in the, right here on the stage and six people looked at us and I think I think they were just there to get it out of some rain or something but, but so I always get a little shiver when I come in the store to be honest with you because I think of that night and I think there's only going to be three people because there were two of us. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, well, uh, let's see. What can I say? Uh, I'm just going to read a little from World Gone By. I'm going to be really simple. I'm just going to read from the opening um, and then take some questions because I think that's a lot more fun than listening to me drone on. Um, 
the, the, it's good to read from this opening because it pretty much sets up the book thematically and mood-wise. You should get a strong feel for what the book is going to be. If you don't like this opening, sneak out when I'm not looking. <laughs> you do, buy the book and you'll be happy, I promise. Um, so this, this is it. This is uh, set um, uh, in December 1942. Um, just going to get some water. So yeah, it's set in December 1942 in Tampa, and that's pretty much it. If I have to tell you anything about the opening, then I'm not doing my job. Um, so. Before the small war broke them apart, they all gathered to support the big war. It had been a year since Pearl Harbor, and they came together in the Versailles Ballroom of the Palace Hotel on Bayshore Drive in Tampa, Florida, to raise money for troops stationed in the European theater. It was a catered affair, black tie, and the evening was mild and dry. Six months later, on a muggy evening in early May, one of the crime beat reporters for the Tampa Tribune would come across photographs from the event. He would be struck by how many of the people who'd been in the local news lately for either killing or being killed had attended the fundraiser that night. He thought there was a story in it. His editor disagreed. But look, the reporter said, look, that's Dion Bartolo standing at the bar with Rico DiGiacomo. And over here, I'm pretty sure that little guy in the hat is Meyer Lansky himself. Here, you see that guy talking to the pregnant woman? He ended up in the morgue back in March. And there, that's the mayor and his wife talking to Joe Coughlin. Joe Coughlin again in this one, shaking hands with the Negro gangster, Montooth Dix. Boston Joe rarely photographed his entire life, but that night he was photographed twice. This guy smoking a cigarette by the Damon White, he's dead. So's that guy. The guy on the dance floor in the white dinner jacket, he's crippled. Boss, the reporter said, they were all together that night. The editor mentioned that Tampa was a small town disguised as a medium-sized city. People cross paths all the time. It was a fundraiser for the war effort. They drew everyone who was anyone. He pointed out to his young, excitable reporter that plenty of other people who attended that night, two famous singers, one baseball player, three voice actors for the city's most popular radio soap operas, the president of First Florida Bank, and P. Edison Half, the, producer of the, the publisher of this very newspaper, were all un quite unconnected to the bloodshed that had erupted back in March and stained the city's good name. The reporter protested a bit longer but found the editor intractable on the subject and so went back to researching rumors of German spies infiltrating the Port Tampa waterfront. A month later, he was drafted into the army. The pictures remained in the photo morgue of the Tampa Tribune long after anyone who was in them had passed from the earth. The reporter, who had died two years later on the beach at Anzio, had no way of knowing that the editor, who would outlive him by 30 years before succumbing to heart disease, was under orders to end the paper's coverage of anything to do with the Bartolo crime family, Joseph Coughlin, or the mayor of Tampa, a fine young man with a fine Tampa family. The city, the editor was told, had already been tarnished for plenty. The participants that night, back in December, had all been engaged, as far as they understood it, in a wholly innocent union of people who supported the soldiers overseas. Joe Coughlin, the businessman, had organized the event because so many of his former employees had enlisted or been drafted. Vincent Imbruglia, who had two bro brothers in the fight, one in the Pacific and one somewhere in Europe, no one could confirm where, ran the raffle. The grand prize was two front row tickets to a Sinatra concert at the Paramount in New York at the end of the month and first class carriage on the Tampa Miami Champion. Everyone bought rafts of tickets even though most assumed the wheel was rigged so the mayor's wife, a huge Sinatra, fa Sinatra fan, would win. The boss of bosses, Dion Bartolo, showed off the kind of dance moves that had won him prizes in his adolescence. In the process, he gave the mothers and daughters of some of Tampa's most respectable families stories to tell their grandchildren. No one who dances with such grace can be as bad as some, as bad as some have claimed. Rico DiGiacomo, the brightest star in the Tampa underworld, showed up with his brother Freddie and their beloved mother, and his dangerous glamour was outdone only by the arrival of Montooth Dix, an exceptionally tall Negro made taller by the top hat that matched his tuxedo. Most members of the Tampa elite had never seen a Negro pass through a party without a serving tray on his palm. But Montooth Dix moved through the crowd of white people like he expected them to serve him. The party was just respectable enough to be attended without regret and just dangerous enough to be worth remarking on for the rest of the season. Joe Coughlin had a gift for bringing the beacons of the city into contact with their demons and making it all seem like a lark. It helped that Coughlin himself, once rumored to have been a gangster and quite a powerful one, had clearly evolved past the street. He was one of the biggest charity supporters in all of West Central Florida. And if the other rumors were true, that he hadn't fully left his criminal past behind, well, 
one couldn't fault a man for a bit of loyalty to those he'd known on the way up. Certainly, if some of the assembled tycoons, factory owners, and builders wished to settle any labor unrest or unclog their supply routes, they knew who to call. Joe Coughlin was the bridge in this town between what was proclaimed in public and how it was achieved in private. When he threw a party, you came just to see who'd show up. Joe himself conferred upon the festivities no further significance than that. When a man threw a party where the upper crust mingled with the street thugs and judges chatted with capos as if they'd never met before, either in court or in a back room, when the Sacred Heart pastor showed up and blessed the room before imbibing with the same gusto as everyone else, when Vanessa Belgrave, the pretty but icy wife of the mayor, raised a glass of thanks in Joe's direction, and a negro as fearsome as Montuke Dix could regale a group of stuffy old white men with tales of his exploits in the Great War, and not a crossword or drunken faux pas was witnessed by anyone, well, that party was not only a success, but it was quite possibly the success of the season. The only sign of trouble occurred after Joe stepped out on the back lawn to get some air and saw the little boy. He moved in and out of the darkness at the far end of the back lawn, zigzag back and forth as if he were playing tag with other boys, but there were no other boys. Judging by his height and build, he was about six or seven years old. He spread his arms wide and made the sound of a propeller and then of a plane engine. He made wings of his arms and careened along the fringe of the tree line, shouting, Varum, Varum. Joe couldn't put his finger on what was odd about the kid, other than being a child alone in an adult party, until he realized his clothes were a good ten years out of date. More like twenty, actually. The kid was wearing knickerbockers, Joe was pretty sure and one of those oversized golf caps boy, boys wore way back when Joe himself had been a boy. The kid was too far away for Joe to get a good look at his face, but he had the odd sensation that even if he were closer, it wouldn't have made a difference. Even from this far away, you could tell the boy's face was irrevocably indistinct. Joe walked off the flagstone patio and crossed the lawn. The boy kept making airplane sounds and ran into the darkness beyond the lawn, vanishing into the sand of trees. Joe heard him buzzing somewhere back in all that darkness. He was halfway across the lawn and someone off to his right whispered, Psst, Mr. Coughlin, sir, Joe? Joe slipped a hand a few inches from the Derringer nestled at the small of his back, not his normal gun of choice, but one he'd found suitable for black tie belts. <laughs> <laughs> it's me, Bobo Frischetti said, as he came out from behind the great banyan tree along the side of the lawn. Joe dropped his hand back in front of himself. Bobo, how's the kid? I'm okay, Joe, you? Tip top. Joe looked at the tree line, saw only darkness. He couldn't hear the kid back in there anymore. He said to Bobo, who brought a kid? What? The kid, Joe pointed. The one was acting like an airplane. Bobo stared at him. You didn't see a kid over there? Again, Joe pointed. Bobo shook his head. Bobo, a guy so small, no one had much trouble believing he'd been a jockey. He took off his hat and held it in his hands. Did you hear about the safe? got opened at the rock crushing place in Lutz. Joe shook his head even though he knew Bobo was talking about the safe that had been robbed of $6,000 at Bay Palms Aggregate, a subsidiary of one of the family's transport companies. Me and my partner had no idea it was owned by Vincent Ambrulia. Bobo waved his arms like an umpire calling a guy safe at home. None. Joe knew the feeling. His entire path in life had been determined when he and Dion Bartolo, barely out of diapers, unknowingly robbed a gangster's casino. So then no big deal. Joe lit a cigarette, offered the pack to the little safe cracker. Just give the money back. We tried. Bobo took a cigarette and a light from Joe, nodded his thanks. My partner, you know, you know Phil? Phil Cantor. Phil the bill because of the size of his nose. Joe nodded. <laughs> Phil went to Vincent and he told him about our mistake. And he said we had the money and we were going to bring it right back. And you know what Vincent did? Joe shook his head, though he had an idea. He chucked Phil right into traffic. Right on Lafayette, middle of the day. Phil bounced off the grill of a Chevy like one ball off a hard break. Hips shattered, knees all fucked up, jaws wired shut. Vincent tells him as he's lying in the middle of Lafayette, you owe us double. You got one week. And he spits on him. What kind of animal spits on a man? Any man, Joe. I'm asking. Never mind one lying on the street with parts of him all broken. Joe shook his head and then held out his hands. What can I do? Bobo handed Joe a paper bag. It's all there. The original amount, or the double Vincent asked for? Bobo fidgeted, looking around at the trees before he looked back at Joe. You can talk to these people. You're not some animal. You can tell them we made a mistake, and now my partner's in the hospital for, I don't know, a month? And that seems a high price. Could you float that? 
Joe smoked for a bit. If I get you out of this, Bobo grabbed Joe's hand and kissed it, most of his lips landing on Joe's watch. If Joe took the hand back, what'll you do for me? You name it. Joe looked at the bag. Every dollar is in here. Every single one. Joe took a drag and then loosed a slow exhale. He kept waiting for the kid to return, or at least the sound of him, but it was clear those trees were empty. He looked at Bobo and said, all right. All right, Jesus, all right? Joe nodded. Nothing's free though, Bobo. I know, I know it. Thank you, thank you. If I ask you for, ever ask you for anything, he stepped in close, anything, you hop right to. We clear? As a bell, Joe, as a bell. And if you Welsh on me, I won't, I won't. If you Welsh on me, I'll have a curse put on you. And not any curse. Which doctor I know in Havana? Motherfucker never misses. Bobo, like a lot of guys who've grown up around racetracks, was highly superstitious. He showed Joe his palms. You won't have to worry about that. I'm not talking about a garden variety hex, Bobo, kind you get from an Italian grandmother and her mustache in New Jersey. <laughs> you do not have to worry about me. I'll honor my death. I'm talking about a Cuba by way of Hispaniola curse. Haunt your descendants. I promise. He looked at Joe with a fresh coat of sweat on his forehead and eyelids. May God strike me dead. Well, we wouldn't want that, Bobo. Joe patted his face. And you wouldn't be able to pay me back. <laughs> Vincent Abreu was set to get bumped up to captain, even though he didn't know it yet, and even though Joe didn't think it was a great idea. But times were tough, street earners were getting rare, some of their best off in the war, so Vincent was getting his promotion next month. Until then, though, he still worked for Enrico, Rico de Giacomo, which meant the money that had been stolen from his stone crushing company front was really Rico's. Joe found Rico at the bar. He slid him the money and explained the situation. Rico sipped his drink and frowned when Joe told him what had happened or poor Phil the bill. He tossed him in front of a fucking car? Indeed. Joe took a sip of his own drink. There's just no style to a move like that. <laughs> I agree. I mean, have a little fucking class. No <laughs> argument. Rico gave it some thought as he bought him another round. It seems to me the punishments already fit the crime and then some. You tell Bobo he's off the hook, but not to show his face in any of our bars for a little while. Let everyone cool down. Broke his jaw, huh? Joe nodded. Well, the man said, yeah. It's too bad it wasn't his nose. Maybe it could have got, I don't know, restructured. Stop looking like God got drunk and put Phil's elbow where his nose was supposed to go. His voice trailed off as he looked around the room. This is some party, boss. Joe told Rico, I ain't your boss anymore. I ain't anyone's. Rico acknowledged that with a flick of his eyebrow, looked around the room some more. Still, it's a hell of a bash, sir. Salute. Joe looked out on the dance floor at all the swells dancing with all the former devs. Everyone polished to a shine. He saw the kid again, or thought he did. The boy peering between the swirl of gowns and ruffled hoop dresses. The boy's face was turned away, the back of his head sporting a small cowlick. No hat on him anymore, but still wearing knickerbocker pants. And then he wasn't there anymore. Joe placed his drink aside and vowed not to have another one for the rest of the evening. <clears throat> In retrospect, he would look back on it as the last party. The final free ride before everything slipped toward that heartless march. But at the time, it was just a great party. Mm -hmm. Thanks. This was like, I used to know a guy when I was coming up, when I was first coming up, he was another writer, and, and he was always teaching us how to be salesmen, which really annoyed those of us who were writers. <laughs> Those are two different things, in case you didn't know. And uh, he would always say, whenever you mention your book and you're actually holding it, put your hand under it. <laughs> and I was like, like it's fucking palm olive? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, can I take some questions, please? Now that we're loosened up and I've gotten the F-bombs out of the way. <laughs> yes, ma'am. What inspires me for this topic? You mean? Well, you mean your, your books, the crime, yeah. justice, and all that. What inspired you? <clears throat> Part of it, I think, is uh, I get it. I understand it. It's it's it's. Um, I don't. I I don't understand. Um, I don't understand people of good education and good upbringing who can then who can then go out of their way to shaft, say, the American public with like a Citizens United. So at the end of the day, I don't understand 
the one percent. I don't understand the corporate mentality. I understand people who get so tired of looking in at the good stuff from the outside of the glass that one day one day they break the glass. I get that. I understand that. That's crime. That's a certain type of crime. Street crime. So I think at the end of the day, I'm always writing about the haves versus the have-nots. I think I'm always writing about the working class trying to trying to maybe slightly alter its position, and and then. Um, that what leads me to crime fiction is that, that seems a natural place to be. You know, um, I don't understand. Again, I don't understand Citizens United, but I understand what happened in Ferguson last summer. You know what I mean? I get that. I want to write. That's what I write about. That's the kind of people I write about anyway. So, um, I, I guess sometimes I go through a book and I go, "Oh, I don't really need a crime." Like the given day, for example, I need a crime, 700 page long, there's no crime in it, and it's global crime, but there's no like, particular crime. Um, and then other books, it just seems like, well, you know, Live By Night. Live By Night is a gangster novel as homage. It's a gangster novel as, as let's, let's, let's do rock and roll gangster. You know, let's just let's, the, read this really exuberant book that doesn't necessarily end well, but um, this, is, this is the gangster in in autumn, you know, this is is this is when the when the choices you've made in your life have caught up to you. That's the whole question. How did you make them so appealing? Many times when I read about you know, crime bosses and stuff, it's just so nauseating. I just don't want to read anymore. Right. Well, you don't want to start with the scene where they blow towards somebody in a basement. That's like step number one. Uh, step number two is to realize that most people who do bad things don't think of themselves as bad people. They think of themselves as flawed people who occasionally have to do bad things. You know, simple as that. Um, and. You know, so Joe Coughlin's no different. Joe Coughlin's done some bad things, but he's done a lot of good things. He tells, hey, I'm a big supporter of charities. I help these hospitals. I do all this other stuff. And in some ways, he's right. And in some ways, he's wrong. And somebody accuses him in the middle of the book. There's a point in the book. The book heads towards this sort of point in the middle is a meeting with just abject evil. And it's, and it's meant to strip away all romanticism of what these guys do. That's the whole point of this chapter. And the guy looks at him and he says this, this sort of, closest we're going to get to the devil in this book and he says you're one of those people who thinks because you feel bad about your get your bad deeds that that makes you good mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's that's it's a very sta standard phenomenon people are like well i i, I did it but i feel bad doesn't that yeah. help <laughs> you know <laughs> uh, so yeah, I mean, it's it's in all of my books. I don't I don't believe in look the vast of I'm saying with you except ninety percent of what we call morality to me is fear of getting caught. It is. Now I don't think we're moral about most. Things. I think we're moral about core things, and I find that very interesting, and I find that very admirable in the human condition. There are things that if nobody was watching you, you still wouldn't do. But that's ten percent. The other ninety percent, you'd be like, "Fuck yeah!" You know what I mean? You mean I can get away? There's no question I can get away with that bag of money. Absolutely none, and it's federally insured. I'm taking it. There's a million things, and if you don't think that's true, just check out the comments section on any article on the internet and see the way people act when they're anonymous. Look at how people act when they're in cars, and they don't think it. You know, as, have you ever? And I mean, once in your life, been in an elevator in an office building, and stepped on somebody's toe or or just did something that pissed them off and had them flip you the bird or go fuck you no it doesn't happen that's polite society but how many times does it happen to you in a car <laughs> all the time because people think they can get away with it so i just think again there's a core a universal hopefully morality in most of us that won't do this 10 percent of real mortal sin but the venial stuff, give me a break. <laughs> that is just fear of getting caught. So that's how I do this. When I write my characters, they never think of themselves as bad. That's it. That's the key. That's why you go, oh, he's got, you know, it's good fellas. Nobody in good fellas thinks they're bad. They're just they're just good fellas. They're movie stars with muscle, as he says at one point. Yes, miss. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the 
I really enjoy your books because Thank they you. deal so much with morality and, you know, when is a, a crime a true crime versus something that somebody's, you know, sort of caught up in doing. Yeah. Um, wh what led you to write about sort of human psychology so much? I mean, was it... I just, I've I'm, I'm just been interested in it my whole life. I just, it, people interest me. People really interest me. I, I, I find them, um, uh, I find people fascinating and I find bullshit annoying, which is going to be a toxic combination. <laughs> Ask my wife. You know. My wife was out with me last week, and she was just like, honey, this is what I'm talking about. We were out with this couple, and, and one of the women told, the woman told this terrible story about this person who did this terrible, terrible thing. Terrible. I mean, one of the worst things I ever heard. And she kept saying, but she's a really nice person. And around the fifth time she said it, I sit down. I don't know how to break this to you, but no, she's not. She's not. And my wife's like grabbing my leg, and she's hitting me, you know, and I'm like, what makes you think this person is nice? And she's like, well, she could be nice to sit I'm like, she cost this woman her job. She got, you know, she's a terrible human being. If this was, you know, the French Revolution, she's the first one I'm sending in the Bastille. So, um... Yeah, so it's it's an interest in people, and then also a need to kind of speak truth to power, um, which does not always make me popular, um, and certainly made me a handful for my parents. But but it's just it's just kind of like in me. It's like locked in. So I work most of it out in books. <laughs> the, the evil that you were describing, King Lucius. Yeah. Did you have a good time writing that, like ten pages? It's hair raising ten pages. I mean, whatever. King Lucius was not fun. No. King okay. Lucius was not fun. I hated writing it, right. and I worked on it over and over and over. Yeah, it was the rewrite job. after rewrite. That that was probably the most rewritten chapter in the book, huh. because I was doing several different things. I was doing a tribute to Joseph Conrad, who is very much an homage to the Heart of Darkness. And the rape of the environment is that phosphorus, you know, he's a phosphorus king, so you see how they mine phosphorus along this river in Florida in the 1940s, it's just hell, you know. And, and so that took a lot of work to give that picture of hell. And then it's no fun being with the devil unless the devil's charming, and that's a line about mm -hmm. Lucius. Somebody says Lucius is the devil, and Joe says no, the devil's charming. And, and so that's the line. There's nothing charming about no. Lucius. He's just pure, unrepentant evil. He's like Stalin. And um, so it wasn't fun being in there. And I, because I had to do it so many times, and I had a layer in this army. He has this army of cannibals <laughs> at the end of Foggy. That was crazy. And, uh, and, he, and then you see the damage to like this woman who's on his boat, and Joe remembers her from when she wasn't damaged. And, and it's all, this is about, this is the moment where, you, where you're meant to see everything that he's put up blinders about. You know, I don't do, I'm not part of all this. You know, I, I'm sort of just, doing the little, I'm doing the clean stuff. No, you're not, you're part of it. And part of it is prostitution, human trafficking, drug addiction, rape of the environment, massive corruption on a huge scale that buys out people and then kills the vote. It's a, um, I did a lot of research recently on Elliot Ness for a project and Ness was a compendium of fascinating facts, but one of the things that was really beautiful was he truly was incorruptible. It's one of his positive sides, he had a lot of negative sides, but one of his positives was that the guy was truly untouchable, he was incorruptible, and it was because he believed, it, he said it was anti-American. He said, if you can buy a judge, then you can buy a vote, and then a vote means nothing to the working man, and that's the basis of American society, the vote. And I just thought, what a cool dude, you know? He was also a raging alcoholic, a complete fame whore, an unrepentant womanizer, I mean, he was a disaster. But he believed 100% in being incorruptible. He couldn't buy it. So anyway, so yeah, uh, Lucius was, uh, in the end, I finished it. I knew I'd hit it You hit it by, I think, the final version, but I did not like doing it. And I didn't like rewriting it either. I was just kind of, I got to go to freaking Lucius again. <laughs> by another token, though, the Ned Lennox chapter, which I would say is one of the more chilling chapters in the book. Ned Lennox is the doctor who Joe goes to to see if he has a tumor. And Ned has everybody in the book kind of has these backstories that flow throughout the book, in like little vignettes. And Ned Lennox is his doctor, and he has a kind of chilling backstory. And then there's a really chilling punchline to his backstory that ends the chapter. And that was a neat, really easy chapter. Right? I don't know why. It's really gross, and like you read it, you go, "This is one of the most disturbing things I've in the book." But yeah, I was just kind of I was with Ned the whole way. He wasn't like Lucius. He wasn't evil. He was just sort of did some bad things. Yes, sir. Uh, I know that Blood by Nights being adapted into a movie. Yeah. Uh, are you writing the screenplay for that? Mm. 
I don't adapt the screenplays in my books ever. Okay. Um, I'm the last guy to trust. I have no perspective. Ben Affleck wrote the screenplay. Okay, and I read I read uh, shortly after the given day was released that that was being turned into a movie as well. No, That's it's not. Uh, I made a huge mistake. I sold that. Um, uh, I think because I just had my first kid. No, it was right before I was going to have my first kid. So I said, "Make your money." Uh, <laughs> what you do when you're about to have a kid. Um, so I sold it, and I did the one rule. I broke the one rule I always said I would never break. I sold it directly to a studio, and the, the and I was terrified the rest of the time because when, if you sell it directly to a studio, they give it to anybody. They just hand it to anybody, and then they realized what I thought they would have realized before they handed me the check, which was this is unfilmable, and they gave me the rights back. And I took them back, and I will not sell it to anybody. I will only consider it as long form limited tel television, like a nine episode miniseries. Was it unfilmable? Because of its length? Yeah, okay. it's huge. Yeah. How do you get this big, massive 700 page book yeah. that isn't just about the Boston police strike and it isn't just about you know domestic terrorism that was going on at the time and it isn't just it's it is about the flu and it isn't you know it's, it's about a year, it's about 12 months in American history um, and somewhat in global history. And so you lose that, you lose the book, you lose a, you know, then you just get a book, a movie about a police strike, who cares? So, is there a possibility yeah. of this? We lose a lot of talk about it, we're talking. <laughs> I go out with some. I go out with. I can't say who because then you look like a, you know, you look like an ass. But I, I there's some there's some famous directors who I occasionally go out with and we talk about, it. and we're trying to figure out how to package it. Sort of murderers row package. You can say who. Get back in. <laughs> so <laughs> the right directors and the right actors and the right writers mm -hmm. to pull it off, and then you take it to the right people because it's a massive project. We're talking about it's a hundred million. Shoot this thing. It's huge. I mean, it's 10 million an episode, nine episodes, nine million. You know, it's just it's a big period piece. It has to be shot reasonably on location. I mean, it's a lot of money. So, thank you. Sir? Can you get, kind of give us a big picture, the big story arc on the jo on the Coughlin series? I mean, his three books starts in Boston, ends up in Tampa. Does it have? Um, yeah, the arc of the Coughlin saga is basically the arc of sort of one family in between the world wars. That's really what I was thinking of. And, uh, and it starts off in Boston, and Joe's a little boy, he's 13 years old in the first book. Uh, in the second book, he basically <coughs> is run out of Boston and ends up uh, becoming involved in the rum trade in Tampa during Prohibition, and rises sort of to the top of his, his station, and then he steps back. He, remove, he's, he is both removed and removes himself from power. Uh, and then the third book picks up, and he's an older man. He's in August. The, 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 first, the Given Day is a book about American exuberance. Um, the Live by Night is about youthful exuberance. This book is about middle age. It's about autumn. It's about entering into the point where you realize, wow, there are consequences to all our decisions, and you know everybody dies. In the end, everybody dies. We none of us is the great line from HUD. Nobody makes it out of this life alive, you know. And and it's it's about a sort of reckoning with all the decisions that everybody's made in the books prior to this, at least metaphorically speaking. And um, and it was also just kind of I was noticing with a, me and a lot of my friends as we entered into middle age, we hit this weird hiccup at various points, the different points, but we all hit it where. The things, it, most of my friends are, are guys, we all grew up kind of working class and we're all pretty self-made guys. And there's a, there's a thing that it takes you to claw your way out of a place and to become a self-made man. That ultimately, it's a quality that ultimately can drag you down if you hold on to it for too long. And so that's what I was looking at. I was looking at the price of ambition and the price of, of being a self-made man. And then, and then all of a sudden one day you turn around and you go, you know, it's actually the, the thought I had in my head on this was it's the moment you get to the point in your life where you go, I have this figured out. I'm standing on solid ground. And then you look down and the ground has just turned to quicksand. And that's really what this book is about. This book is all about how it is all sliding away before Joe is even close to figuring it out. He's behind one step the entire book. So happy times. You know. <laughs> yes. You said you, you write about things that you're familiar with. So growing up, did you know a Patrick and an Angie or a Bubba and 
And now that Patrick and Angie have retired, any chance of Bubba coming back by himself in the book? Well, I don't know if Patrick and Angie retired. I sort of retired. They may come back. You know, but, I mean, you look at James Lee Burke retired Dave Robichaux like 32 <laughs> times. <laughs> Every time he quits and then comes back. He's in something else. So I could I could see that. I understand why uh, you know Jim's done that because you kind of. If you're a, if you're if you're a writer whose core is based in in realism or naturalism, it's very hard to go too far down the ro road of a series because a series starts to become really artificial. It just seems how many cases can these guys get? In, you know, um, how many times can they fight the fight? You know, the, the fight against the heart of darkness. You know, it's just they're just two PIs living in Dorchester. You know what I mean? Like how many times can serial killers come to their door or whatever? You know? um, so. Uh, you know, would I bring them back? You know, possibly. I mean, possibly. And would I bring Bubba back? Yeah, possibly. Are they based on anybody? Not really. I very rarely based anybody on anybody. Um, there's pieces of them that I know where I got from. Uh, there's uh, Bubba is based on a, an amalgam of people I knew growing up. Just I, I have this weird ability. Um, the guys who scared everybody else felt really comfortable around me. It was really weird. It was just this weird thing. And so I would all of a sudden end up like, you know, talking to some guy who was terrifying. I remember talking to a guy once when he rolled a bunch of people in a car. He literally rolled the car. Like he got pissed at somebody and they were in a car and went to hide in the car. So he rolled the car and did a lot of damage and then felt bad. Emergency room because he got glass in their face because he rolled their car. And he, and he came and he just talked to me about it. It was really weird because I was up sitting on this stoop until like three in the morning and him saying, you know, I don't mean to do those kind of things. It's just, you know, sometimes people just shouldn't talk to me that way. You know, I just, okay. Uh, you know, like, like, wow, you could just don't get mad at me. You know, uh, so I, I started to see the sort of little boy in those people. And that's really what Bubba is to me. He's this, he's his inner child is this deranged cherub. And it's, and it's, always, it's always in play. Always in play. Um, but I don't base, it's funny, the one person you'll see in this book who I based actually on somebody is Montooth Dix, who's the black gangster. And uh, it was a story I just fell in love with, which was from, uh, from a little bit of research I did into the mob. And what it was was, and I believe it was, I, it's been too many years now, it's been like two years since I first came across the story, but I, th I believe it was in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn, it was the black section of Brooklyn, and it was run by this, this black guy. Was handling, he handled policy, he handled numbers, and that was the most money that really came out prior to drugs in the criminal end world, was people playing the numbers. So Albert Anastasia, who was on the rise at that point, and was a hitman and was trying to run a crew, he said, I want to take over his policy. So he sent in two guys to beat this guy up, but the guy thought they'd come to kill him because they looked like him. So he killed them first. And everybody understood it. Everybody in, in the mob, like they had a, had a sit down and everybody said, we like this guy. Why were you stupid enough to go try and bother him? Because now we have to go. Now we have to. Because he went against the family, he killed two guys, one of them was made, the rules are rules, he's gotta die. And everybody liked him, you know, but they had to kill him. So he went to ground, nobody could find him. Nobody, and his policy was a mess and the, the numbers were a mess and nobody, but nobody could find this one guy. Again, I'm blanking on his name. And um, in, the, in that time period, he, he got really sick. He went to a, he snuck out to a doctor, and the doctor said, you've got cancer and you're dying. Like, you've got pretty serious, but I, I don't know if it's lung cancer or what, but you're dying. You've got about four months to live. So he took another month to get his affair in order and said goodbye to everybody. And then one day, he just showed back up on the streets of Brooklyn and let everybody know, like walking around, like, hey, how you doing? What's up? And word got out. And by the end of the day, they sent a hit squad to get him. And he did suicide by mafia. I love that. I just love that story. He was killed right at the end of the day near his car. And, he, and they say he turned and he held up his arms like this. And I just thought, that is just, just something about that story I just love. I based Montooth on him. You'll see, like, Montooth doesn't go that way, but Montooth is a guy who's an honorable guy who's running his business the best he can. And somebody, we don't know exactly who's pulling the strings, somebody comes to push him off his, his numbers. And then it doesn't go well because he's not somebody you should screw around with. But then it becomes the individual against the corporation because the corporation says, well, we love you, but you can't kill one of our guys. You've got to go. So then, becomes, then Montu becomes this character kind of fighting against the organization. Joe's trying to save him, and it just becomes a mess. So, yes, miss? Um, 
Mystic River was such a haunting story. You know, it was a ways back. Yeah, no how did the story, do you, how did that story come to you? How did the story of Mystic River come to me? Mm -hmm. Part of it was just something that happened when I was a kid. It was just an incident that happened when I was a kid. When me and a friend of mine got arrested, well, not arrested, we got taken away by some police fighting in the street. Mm -hmm. And then we forgot to ask for their badge numbers, and my mother freaked out. Really freaked out. <laughs> like, like, that was something we'd been trained to do since we were little. And the look on her face just stuck with me and haunted me for about 25 years. And Dan and I, see, I'm sure my kids have already seen it by now. Uh, did on my face. You know, my, my daughter will turn to me and I'll leave her out front for two seconds to run and grab something. And I'll come back to, you know, or a little place at the front yard and she'll say, Oh, I just met so and so. Mm -hmm. What don't we do with strangers, Jim? You, know? you know? But he, but he's not a stranger because he said hi. <laughs> no, that's a stranger. You know, like so it was that same that same thing with um, my mother and stuck with me and then I just one day I started thinking the worst case scenario, what happened if we got in that car and those guys weren't cops? And then, and then it led into all these other things. And it, Mystic River was really just, uh, it was, it was, it was, I mean, it's, you know, it's my love letter to the world I grew up in, you know, really. And, and it's my condemnation of the world I grew up in. It's a lot of things. It's a very, you know, it's a, um, there's a lot in that book um, in, in, in many different ways. And uh, there's only two books I'm really happy with in my career. I, 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 you know, I shouldn't tell you this because then you'd be like, well, why should we buy the other thing? <laughs> <laughs> but if you're any good at this, I really do believe this, this, is, this is a job for sadomasochists. Uh, if you're any good at this, you're just never ultimately satisfied with what you did. But I came close twice, I think, with Mr. Groover and The Given Day. Those are the two books where I kind of go, a little golf clap for yourself. You did all right, you know? Um, the rest of them, I'm just kind of, uh, but yeah, so um, in Mystic River, maybe because it was held in the chamber for so long, I got first got the idea for that book when I was, uh, I want to say I was about 27. I didn't write it until I was 34. Mm -hmm. So it was a feeling of I need to get stronger. I look at my first five series books as, as working out. I really do. Building muscle. Just building muscle, building muscle, building muscle. And I remember when I was finishing Prayers right now, I was like, I'm ready to do that book. And then it, and I, and I know and it's going to just flow out of me. It took me two and a half years. It was pure hell. It sucked. And it was terrible. It was like the worst writing experience I've ever had. But I nailed it. At the end of the day, I sat over it and I went, okay, I got you. Yeah, so. Yes, Miss? Well, I have to first say, um, I love all your books, but Mystic River is definitely a book that people will be reading forever. I mean, it's just, just Thank it's you. Thank you. So glad you got my check. Literature. Yeah. 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 The friendships in it and the relationships are just Back to the movie, I had a question about movies. So, have you generally been happy with movie versions yeah. of your books? I've been very happy with movie versions of my books. They've been great. I mean, what you pray for is that they get the spirit of your book, not that they get the letter. They, you, that, that can't work. It, you know, if somebody films your exact book, it's a 10 hour movie. Um, so, you just want them to get the essence. And that has happened three times now. For better or for worse, those, those are my, you know, that's the best adaptations I've seen. I can't say it. No, because in the age of the internet, if it was just us, I'd say it. But you know, it's the age of the internet. I mean, you know, and, you just, and then you just you're picking a kid, and then somebody's gonna go tell the other two kids. And they're gonna be pissed, you know. So I have a favorite, and and I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm very happy. You know, I know which one I think is the best, without a doubt. But um, but you know, again, it's. Um, the other thing is, is I don't actually, I wouldn't trust my judgment on the films either because it's all weird for me. I mean, it's just weird. You sit there and you say, yeah, they're really good. But I don't have what you guys have when you see a movie. When you see a movie, what happens within the first five minutes, what happens to me if I'm not seeing a movie of a book of mine, is uh, you fall into the collective dream. You suspend your disbelief. It becomes real to you in some strange way. Um, that never happens when you're seeing an adaptation of your own work. You just keep sitting there the whole time going. It's an interesting choice. You know, it's not the same thing as, as being sucked into a movie, you know? So. Yes, Miss, with the baby. With the three movies, since we're not going to make you pick a favorite, but what was the favorite thing you thought each um, screenwriter captured in each of the movies that you really thought, like, that? Was, I'm glad they got that from the book? I'm glad they captured that. That's a good question. Um, I would say that Clint and Brian Hoglund captured the Greek tragedy. The, the, 
or a Shakespeare tragedy, whichever tragedy you want to pick, model for Mystic River, because it's a tragedy. It's always set to be a, you know. Uh, ben Affleck captured Dorchester. Yeah. If you didn't, if you don't know Dorchester, it won't mean anything to you. But if you know Dorchester, he captured it, and that's not bad for a Cantabrian. Ouch! That's what we call Cantabrians. Bad? You know what you call people from Dorchester? Yeah. Rats. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and then what Martin Scorsese got, and and, and he got he had, some critics actually took us to the woodshed for it, but he got it was. It was always fake. It was always meant to be really fake. Shutter Island is meant to be an homage to Gothics, to my love of the Brontes and the Shelley, and 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 to uh, to 1950s B movies, and and it's meant to be heightened. So when you watch the opening of the movie and you kind of like, whoa, what is this obscene? Because it's not real, because it's not. It's the only thing I've ever written that wasn't naturalistic. There's nothing naturalistic about Shutter Island. It's it's completely heightened, and. <coughs> Uh, Marty, as we call him. Uh, 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 Marty got it. So uh, that's, that was my three favorite things. His grandfather's from Dorchester. What's that? His grandfather's from Dorchester. That, that little little baby's grandfather's from Dorchester? Is that a boy? He's a boy. Jackson He's a, William. Jackson William? He needs to get back to Dot. Come on. The toughen you up kid. Build some character. <laughs> Um, yeah, I got a question now. This is yes. a very romantic uh, period, Florida, Cuba, this era. Yeah. Does it any of it still exist, or did you have to reimagine all this? Cuba, as I understand it, froze in 1959. I mean, it was, I've always heard it. I haven't seen it. I've seen pictures. But as I understand it, Havana looks like it did exactly in 1959. And, you know, welcome to a crumbling infrastructure. But, yeah. Um, Ybor City in Tampa is the only part of Florida that I can think of. Um, including South Beach, and I spent a fair amount of time off, that, that looks exactly like it did in 1910 or 1920, as long as you remove the cars. Remove the cars and you remove the, the signs hanging from the buildings. The buildings are all the same. That is an astronomical thing in the state of Florida. Because in Florida, if the paint chi chips on a five-year-old shopping mall, they bulldoze it and put up a Hooters. I mean, they just, they tear down everything. They don't care. I would say with, with, with Florida, when I lived there, I would say Florida, you know, the license plate says Florida Sunshine State. And I, I, honestly, it should say Florida. Fuck the environment. Because that's the state of Florida. <laughs> they just don't care. They've got plenty of land. They're yeah. fine. Yeah. They tear it down. Ebor, because it had this incredibly strong central community that was made up of outsiders, it was, it was a place where they pushed everybody. They pushed the Cubans. They pushed... The African Americans, they pushed the Italians. And they said, stay there. Oh, the Spanish. The Spanish actually came in. So everybody got pushed to Ebor. And they said, work in our factories and stay there. As long as you don't come out, as long as you don't cross the invisible border into White Tampa, we're fine. Knock yourself up. And so they created this really close knit kind of like Casablanca, you know? Mm -hmm. And then they preserved it. And traditions have been handed down. Mm -hmm. And so the those four major social clubs, that, are, that were in Ybor City at the time of Joe Coughlin are still there. Wow. Uh, several of the hospitals. And they did, they did Obamacare before Obama, way before Obama. They, in Ybor City, if you got sick in the 1920s and you were Spanish, you went to the Spanish hospital, your bills were taken care of. Right. If you got sick and you were Italian, you went to the Italian hospital, your bills were taken care of. Everybody took care of each other. And it was this kind of utopia in a lot of ways. And, um, and then, and then ultimately, the depression affected it the way it affected everything else. And then the cigar business went belly up. And then, you know, then, but but they still preserved. And so, that's amazing in Florida. It's not amazing in Boston, but it's incredible in Florida. So I was obsessed with the idea of of Ebor being this. To me, it's an imagined place. It's a romantic place. It's not real. I'm sure that back in the 1920s, it sucked being there, even if you got free health care. <laughs> but I see it as this wonderful kind of urban utopia. Mm -hmm. and, I, and a melting pot, a real melting pot. And so I just wanted to, I wanted to play with that. Any more? Are we done? Oh. Yes, sir? You, have a, you, know, you still have a home in Boston, right? Mm -hmm. uh -uh. <laughs> no? <laughs> no, we're looking at getting one soon, but we don't know. Oh. Right now. Oh, you, uh, it, you should wait until all the stalactites melt. <laughs> from all the, I would go, I am so sick. Everybody was saying all this winter, you know, don't you, aren't you glad you're not in Boston because I'm in Santa Monica? 
<laughs> and I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to be back in it. I mean, it must have been, I'm telling you, the parties would have been thrown. I'm telling you, it would have been all right. Uh, and that's, that's BS, because my kids who were very young and were like bouncing off the walls, and like, daddy, 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 you know, can we go outside? You can't go outside because it's 10 below. I changed my tune, but but I was just watching the news reports like, oh. There was a, there was a thing where uh, somebody made the news because uh, they, they shoveled out their spot in Southie, and they put it in a chair, and it's a big thing in, in mm -hmm. South Boston, Dorchester, East Boston, Charlestown. They, if you shovel out your spot, it's yours for 72 hours. So, and sometimes till spring. But, uh, <laughs> so they shoveled out their spot, they put a chair and they came back from work that night and they found somebody parked in their spot. So they shoveled all the snow back into the spot. <laughs> and then they took a picture of it and they put it up on, on YouTube and it went crazy, it went viral, everybody was talking about it. When I was growing up, because I'm from Dorchester, we're even meaner. Um, people did that, but then they went and they got a hose. And they sprayed it. And then they iced the car in. And if you iced the car in, it wasn't coming out for months. There was no shoveling it. It was real cold. So, um, and I was like, oh, the good old days. Remember freezing a car in? Yeah, and meanwhile, then I'm going out and, you know, taking my girls to the beach. And my wife's like, isn't this beautiful? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. <laughs> yes, miss. So when you grew up, it was probably pretty racially divided. And yes. So yes, where did you get your sense of um, justice from, or your, your sense of... Well, where, where I grew up in Boston, when I was growing up, Boston was pretty racially divided. Balkanized is the way I put it. It was, you know, you knew this neighborhood was this and this neighborhood was that where I grew up. It was, I grew up in the one neighborhood where it actually wasn't. I grew up where um, South Boston, Roxbury, Dorchester, and the tip of Mattapan all met. So I grew up in court, sort of the center of it all. And when everything exploded in Boston, when the race the issues really came to a boil in 1974 with the federal desegregation of the Boston Public Schools. I was nine. And I saw it, and I saw plenty of ugly stuff, and I was victim to plenty of ugly stuff, and I saw people do plenty of ugly stuff. And it forged an opinion in me pretty quickly, because my opinion on Boston has always been that it was an extremely noble idea, terribly executed, that, and, and you, nobody in the city could miss the fact, nor get justice for the fact, that every b architect behind busing made sure that busing could not happen where they lived. It could only happen in the city where the working class lived. So the architects of busing stood back and watched to see what would happen. So you grew up with these two different minds. You sat there and you said, well, of course there should be desegregation of the schools, and of course there should be equal, you know, equal school systems, of course, but is this the way to do it? And is there an inherent hypocrisy in the people who are doing it? And then, oh my God, we're getting painted with the same brush as these horrible, I mean, um, horrible racists over here, and they were horrible. I remember seeing the KKK walking down the street in South Boston. The KKK. Uh, it was terrifying um, and awful and really embarrassing. So I grew up with this kind of thing of I'm stuck, I can't find a side. And the only thing I did know, and it became my first adult thought, was. Why are we fighting each other? Because it seems like it's in the best interest of the ruling class to keep the working class fighting amongst themselves. So they don't see who the real enemy is. And I see that now. And not only has it not, not stopped happening, it, they've turned it into an art form, in my opinion. At this point, it is now an art form. When you have all of these people, in my opinion, all of these working class people completely voting against their own best interests because they want to believe that we are a pure meritocracy. And we are not a pure meritocracy. We are a meritocracy, we're better than any country on the planet, and you know, I don't, but we are a very flawed meritocracy. And yes, everybody has an equal opportunity, but the sides, the, the scales are a little so tilted towards some others. people more than others, you know? So um, that, that basically became me kind of looking at this world and just going, I don't buy any of it, you know? Um, and that gave me a sense of very early on saying, I don't see the color is BS. Anybody who ever talks about 
you know, anybody who ever talks even in the least coded racism about a race, an entire race, is an idiot. It's just an idiot. There's nothing to say. Um, and it, it, it's at the end of the conversation for me. I'll be like, uh-huh, and then I just check out. Um, so that that is probably, does that sort of answer your question? Yeah. I mean, I think, and then the other thing is, is I probably just had, I'm seeing it with one of my daughters now. I think you just have an artistic personality. You just, you know, I was always that person who was always like, yeah, but that was that probably should have been my middle name. Yeah, but. Yeah, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but. Really did, yeah, but I don't know. I, what if? What about? And you know, and everybody shut up. You know. And, uh, yeah, but. You know. um, and I, there's a line I wrote about. I think it's said to Joe. It was meant to be said to Luther Lawrence, but I it didn't fit in given day, so I put it into Live by Night. It's probably the truest line, and I wrote it completely about myself. Somebody says to Joe Coughlin, um, "Your problem is." that you see the worst in the best of people and the best in the worst of people. Mm -hmm. And that is my nature to the core. Mm -hmm. If you say to me, oh, look at that wonderful cardinal, you should respect him. <laughs> and I go, uh, <laughs> his closet is a dark and ugly place. <laughs> and if you say to me, stay away from him, he's a drug dealer, I go, oh, no, no drug dealers are bad. I've met plenty of nice drug dealers. <laughs> I'm go over and I go talk to him. You know? It's just this contrary nature, I think. Uh, so, uh, number two, thing that drives my wife crazy. Uh, so, yeah, and I think it's a good thing to have if you're an artist. I don't think if you're, particularly if you're a writer, I don't think you should, I don't think you should be satisfied with the status quo if you're a writer. It's a lonelier job, but I think you're better at it if you're just not, if you don't buy the party line. Whatever the party line may be, whatever the accepted perceived wisdom is at the time, don't buy it. And that makes you really fun at dinner parties. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.